Welcome to my shtetl, the Veljechelm. I am Gimple. Folks call me Gimple the Fool. The Helm is full of fools like me. You might imagine that I'm offended at being called a fool. Nonsense! As the good book says, it is better to seek counsel from a wise man who thinks himself a fool than a fool who thinks himself a wise man. Not everyone here considers himself a fool. Some people take themselves quite seriously. For example, I want to tell you about my friend Yitzhak, the feather merchant. Yitzhak was by nature easygoing. The feather business had been rewarding, but these last few years had been hard on Yitzhak. His neighbor Shmuel believed that some rich fat butcher from Warsaw was the Mashiach the Messiah, and that anyone who didn't support him was a mino, a mensch in name only. Yitzhak avoided Shmuel as he was afraid to even speak to him. A bedbug infestation was spreading through the land. The feather trade had virtually come to a halt due to fear that the feathers could be harboring bedbugs. Some believe this plague was due to the Z conspiracy. Z for Czar, who it was said had been putting bedbugs in the pillows as a way to corner the feather market. Others believed the bedbugs were spies put there by the Cossacks. But who knows? As the good book says, anything's possible. All this and more had Yitzhak off balance. Sometimes he would be full of grief and cry uncontrollably. Sometimes he would shake with fear, too frozen to act. Sometimes he felt that those who thought differently than him were stupid and dangerous, and he fell up with anger and hatred. But mostly he just felt weak and depressed at his inability to fix his life. One day, while walking home in these thoughts, Yitzhak lost track of where he was and began to wander aimlessly. That is where I saw him. I greeted him. Guten Morgen, Yitzhak. What are you doing over here in my side of town? Yitzhak aroused from his inner confusion and sensing in me a kindred spirit, confessed his distress. Oh, Gimple, I'm just too mashuga, crazy. I'm sad, angry, fearful all at once. I feel so hopeless. I told him, the Rev. Emmett is a man of great faith. Maybe he can help. His very name means faith. Let me take you there. Rev. Emmett invited us in and listened to Yitzhak's story. He stroked his long beard and thought a good long while. Yitzhak, the world is spinning too fast, changing too much. You must slow it down, throw a wrench in the works, plug the hourglass, reverse the arrow of time, turn back the clock. The Baal Shem Tov lived a simple life. Without all the troubles you have, Moses was rewarded for doing as God asked. Adam had his troubles, but he did not protest. Yitzhak, You must stop your complaining. Follow the old ways. Your ancestors will not lead you astray. Well, we headed back to my house. Yitzhak thought about the Rebbe's words. He considered living like the ancestors, but he had no idea how to make time go backwards. He told me, Gimple, I still feel confused. I'm depressed. The Rebbe's words make me feel like a failure. Luckily, I had another idea. Far into the forest, where I collect the firewood I sell, there's a cave where a hermit lives. Some believe he is mad, but others say he is the most penetrating vision of all. I'll take you to seek his counsel. And so they began walking into the woods. I led Yitzhak deep into the forest where the trees grew thick 
and the trail disappeared. And there we found a small cave where the hermit was said to live. Peering in, we called out, is anyone here? A voice called back, no, not anyone. It is I, Ra, the one who sees. They stumbled into the cave and as their eyes adjusted to the growing darkness, they can make out an ancient wrinkled man sitting on the stone floor and Yitzhak asked, why do you sit there in the darkness, Ra? I see best when not distracted by the light of day and the chaos of life. What brings you to my cave? As Yitzhak unburdened his heart, Ra'am, Ra'a began to hum a nagoon. He apparently felt that Yitzhak's words were just a distraction. When Yitzhak finished, Ra'a broke into an hilarious laughter. Yitzhak was a bit offended. What prey is so funny? <laughs> the whole world is filled with his glory. All is joy, and most of it is quite amusing. Did you not just hear all my troubles, Yitzhak objected? Hush! All is unfolding as it should. Does the sound of one raindrop matter to the storm? Who are we to ask the winter not to follow the autumn? Frustrated, Yitzhak demanded, but bra, what is the answer? Love is the answer. But what was the question? All is one is all. All the raindrops form the ocean, but is not the whole ocean foreseen by each separate raindrop? One thing becomes the next. Nothing can be created or destroyed. It is all Hashem vibrating, singing, and dancing, masquerading as stuff, posing as you. Yitzhak, Yitzhak, your time is sand, your ways are leaves upon the sea. And then, as if no one else was in the cave, Ra began again. I mean, his nagoon. Yitzhak and Gimple crawled out of the cave and slowly walked back home in the failing light. And as they walked, Yitzhak complained that he felt more and more disturbed than ever. He had no idea how to act on the wisdom of someone like Ra. I said to Yitzhak, as it is written, too much wisdom can leave one bloated and queasy. When I have such an illness, I find it best to carefully review what I have learned. I would take some bicarbonate and sleep on it. And when Yitzhak got home, he did exactly that. He had a bowl of chicken soup, reflected upon his day, and went and fell into a deep sleep. Yitzhak was suddenly awoken by a loud shofar blasting in his ear. He opened his eyes, and he saw Gabriel, the messenger. Take heed. You will be visited by three more angels tonight who will each offer you a valuable lesson. Soon the first angel appeared. I am Michael, he who is like God. For is that not our task, to divide that which is like God from that which is not. Suddenly, Yitzhak found himself high on a mountain. There he saw Moses herding his sheep. Oh, great Moshe, Reb Emmet says that to find peace, I must become more like you. Moshe interrupted, like me, hounded by slaves, Jethro constantly barking orders, and even Hashem, bickering, telling me what to do and how to do it. Oy vey, the smell of the sheep, and don't get me started on the climate, the constant wildfires that will, will not go out. No, Yitzhak, you don't want my life. Live your own darn life. With this, Moshe began to slowly fade away. 
dissolving into a mist, but still he went on talking. The only thing you should take from me is to pay attention to your own experience, ask the deep questions, and most importantly, for the answers, listen to the still, small voice within. In the next moment, Moshe was entirely gone. Yitzhak, still standing on the mountain, closed his eyes and listened carefully for the still, small voice. But all he heard was the breeze whispering in the trees. And when he opened his eyes again, he found himself back in his own bed. But he was not alone. Beside the bed stood the angel Uriel. Eternal fire I am. Change I am. The only thing constant change is. Hashem's handiwork, show you I will. Suddenly, Yitzhak was back on a mountaintop, but this time the mountain was so high that from its peak one could look down on the majesty of all creation. As Yitzhak watched, he could see oceans rise and fall, seasons change in the blink of an eye. He watched mountains shooting up and eroding away, continents rearranging like pieces of a moving puzzle. And then the mountain seemed to become something celestial, a distant asteroid floating in space. As they looked out, they could see clouds of gas swirling and condensing, galaxies colliding, suns and planets formed and dissolved in an endless, out of the endless debris. There was no center, nothing held still. Yitzhak was dizzy. One thing caused the next. The first was a consequence of what came before. What was a human life in the midst of such chaos? Frightened, he cried out, Am I just a cog in a huge machine? Uriel announced, In the great unfolding, new forms endlessly effervesce. In a web of all that has ever happened, suspended you are. Separate from the ocean, the raindrop never is. Hmm? Without his shell, the tortoise never travels. Hmm? Feeling alone, the wave in the ocean does not. Hmm? Yitzhak wondered, how could I ever find my way in such a restless sea? Find your way. Your way make you must. A mystery the future is, but the author you are. The stage is set, but enter the scene you must. In your story's beauty, Hashem delights, but only when compassion you reach for, tears of joy to his eyes do come. Comedy and tragedy just viewpoints are. The story ends not. Nothing really ever stops. Hmm? As Yitzhak pondered Uriel's words, the whole cosmos began to spin. He shut his eyes, he was so dizzy. But when he opened them again, he was relieved to find himself back in his own bed under a warm blanket with a solid roof over his head. He began to drift off. However, before he was even half asleep, he found himself awakened by the soothing touch of Raphael, the healer. Silently, Raphael beckoned for Yitzhak to follow him. He pointed to the slight glow in the horizon to indicate the night would soon be over. <clears throat> the angel Raphael led him to the cottage of his grandparents, and once inside, he beckoned Yitzhak, go up the stairs to the room where his Alti Bubby, his great grandmother, had once lived. He had not seen her since she died when he, she was only a small child, and yet there she sat in her rocking chair, just as he remembered her. What are you weaving, Bubby? Yitzhak asked. Each day, 
The shawl your soul wears must be rewoven. Your stories and ambitions must be refreshed. Here, look, you can see the threads of the past, all your memories, your deeds, your impressions with yesterday and yesteryear, both the good and the bad, the joyous and the painful. All these threads must be gathered and woven anew. Yesterday's cloth has lost its shine. It's time to reweave it again into a vibrant new shawl. Yitzhak asked, do you do this every night, Bubby? The new can only be made from the old, but we must do the making. We only have the old cloth to work with, but it is no good, too flimsy, too fragile. The once bright colors have faded with time. Can you feel how uncomfortable it is to wear such old, ill-fitting cloth? These special knitting needles I have borrowed from Hashem pull just the right stitches from your dreams. Visions and passions are always being dreamt up within you. So I gather the strands together here to remember, to weave with Chaim, with life. The past must be rewoven with your dreams and ways that will inspire you whatever today's weather brings. Yitzhak looked upon the beautiful shawl, so vibrant, so attractive. Bubby, can I learn to knit like that? Can you? <laughs> you must! Come visit me every night and I will teach you. As his old great-grandmother continued to knit, she slowly rocked back and forth, back and forth, and Yitzhak's eyes became heavy, and soon he was drifting off to sleep. As the daylight woke him, he remembered his dreams, and he began to laugh. It had been a long time since he laughed like this. He laughed at his dream of Moses. He laughed at the archangels. And when he thought it was all a bubby, he just smiled. But his eyes laughed. And for the first time in years, Yitzhak remembered what his name meant. He who laughs. Fortunately for you and me, he immediately wrote down the dreams and put them in an envelope to send to me so I can share them with you. But as usually happens with dreams, the details faded from Yitzhak's head by breakfast. Yet Yitzhak felt happier and more at peace than he could recall. As he put on a shawl and prepared to face the day, he felt surprisingly rested and renewed and ready to do what he could to make the world a better place.